Good morning. It is early. This is another episode of Enter the Word. I want to welcome you. Today we're going to be talking about the atonement. I want you to know I'm up really early. So is my cat. And she's kind of talkative. So you may hear her a little bit. Um, kind of sounds like a person at times. Um, but anyway, that's this is the early morning. I'm uh, doing this now and I got to deal with whatever comes along with that. And part of that is the cat who's very excited that I'm up super early this morning. I got up at about 3.30. It is finally now right around 5.20. And, uh, and so it's early. But, um, but I wanted to get this teaching started, and I wanted to get the atonement topic discussed. So I'm up early just to have some time uh, to be able to do this, put it all together, and get it ready for you. And so here we go. We're going to be talking about the atonement. And uh, the atonement is used often, it's taught often etymologically. So people look at the word atonement. And of course, what you'll see in that word is what it means in the word, et one meant. And uh, which has to do, which has something to do with, with Christ dying so that we could be one with God. Um, it, there's also a medieval Latin equivalent of this word um, that is uh, adenamentum. I, I, don't, I don't know Latin, so when I look at it, I have to pronounce it. But adenamentum, which means unit, which means unity. I'm going to take some things off that like to click around. I like to move my hands a lot when I'm talking, so they, sometimes my ring will hit the table or, or my watch will hit the table, so i got to remove that stuff. Um, this at one month in Christian theology refers to the, the reconciliation between God and humanity um, that has been made possible through Jesus' death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection from the grave. We can see this in Mark 10, 45. I'm going to read this from the New International Version. It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, however, what uh, William Lane Craig points this out, and he makes a good point here, um, the etymological meaning doesn't do complete service to the biblical meaning of, the, of what the Bible talks about when it speaks of the atonement. So, for example, if we're going to look at the Greek words of this, then one of the words um, that's used by, for example, by the writer of the book of Hebrews is alaskome. Um, and that's uh, found in chapter 2 and verse 17 it says this specifically for this reason he had to be made like them fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement the new, this is the new international version but the new american standard translates that to make propitiation for the sins of the people now Lascomay has a, has a few meanings. There's a there there's no way to completely if you're if you're bilingual you understand that there's no way to completely and perfectly bring a Greek word into an English meaning. There's a there's a semantic domain. Um, I have a he I had a Hebrew professor, Dr. Harlow, who described it this way. He would put his hands up like this and he would say, you "Take the one language like Hebrew and you take the English language and they match about like that." <laughs> And so, so uh, understanding that using etymology is a bit tricky. Somebody has said that um, etymology is not theology. It helps. It's a part of the, the hermeneutical work that we do. It's part of the exegetical work that we do. But, it's, but you can't base everything on the etymology. So elaskome means to render propitious, which means to regain favor to oneself or to appease or to conciliate to oneself. It also means to expiate, which means to atone or correct or apologize or compensate. So rather than being separated from God, the atonement of Christ has given sinful humanity the ability or the opportunity to be in a relationship with God. God has initiated the reconciliation. That's important for us to remember, especially as Wesleyan Arminians, because our Calvinist, especially five-point Calvinists, 
uh, brothers and sisters will sometimes accuse Wesleyan Arminians of saving ourselves, of believing that we can save ourselves, but we don't, we don't believe that at all. God has initiated this reconciliation, and it's the individual's responsibility. Um, Leighton Flowers points out, rightly so, that responsibility means you have a response ability. You have the ability to respond. So God has initiated the reconciliation, and it's the individual's responsibility to respond to this gift of God's divine provision with repentance and faith in Christ. So you can respond with conversion, as we would call it. Um, Romans 3.25 in the New International Version says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. So here the Apostle Paul uses in that passage in Romans a different Greek word that's translated atonement. Um, and that word is uh, elasterios. So elasterios, is, it relates to appeasing or correcting. It's a lot like the word elaskome. It's used by the Hebrew writer. To understand the atonement uh, being made at the cost of the blood of the Son of God has to be kept within the Trinitarian theological construct. Otherwise, it makes, it makes Jesus look like this poor, innocent son of, of a psychopathic God. Um, it kind of looks like, it makes God look a little bit like Thanos in uh, the movie Avengers Infinity War, where he's willing to just sacrifice his child to, 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 for the good of the world. You know, and, and it just seems kind of hateful and, and cruel um, to many. So we have to keep this within the Trinitarian construct. And why do I say that? Well, the atonement was foreseen by God uh, way back in Genesis 15 by God's covenant with Abraham. And, uh, and, and so I'm going to show you this passage of Scripture. And we'll see that, that this, this comes from Genesis chapter 15. begins with verse uh, th 3 and goes through verse 6. Oh, wait a minute. That's the Isaiah passage. Okay, so I don't have that passage for you, but let me look that up for you, and I will, I will read that for you. This comes from Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> I don't mind saying I'm supposed to have this ready, and I could give you all kinds of excuses why I didn't, but let's see here. Yeah. From Isaiah... Let's look first at Isaiah 15, um, or Genesis 15, let's see. Yeah, Genesis, I need to go to Genesis, because I only have the Isaiah passage there for you. And I'm not going to keep redoing this teaching. I want to wanna be able to go ahead and uh, I have this ready for you. So, what happens in this passage is that God makes a covenant with Abraham. Abraham uh, goes into a sleep, a deep sleep, and his name is still Abram at the time. God has, this is before God makes this covenant, he's Abram. After, then he's Abraham, which means the father of many nations. Uh, so Abram is making a covenant with God, or God's making a covenant with Abram. And what he does is he, he has animals, and they're cut in half, and, and they're split on both sides of a path called a blood path. That's kind of cruel and, and uh, strange to us, but at the time, it was very meaningful. And they would put these animals on, uh, cut them in half, create a blood path, with the, and you would walk between the animal carcasses. And as you walk through the blood, the blood would be on your feet and on your, your clothing as you walk through this path. And it was symbolizing that if you should break this covenant, that this is what will happen to you, that you will suffer the consequences of breaking the covenant. Well, if we go to verse 17, uh, what we see is this. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abraham saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. And that's a symbol that God himself will suffer, no matter who breaks the covenant. Of course, God's not going to break the covenant. But even if Abram breaks the covenant, God is saying, I will suffer the consequences of you breaking the covenant. So this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 15. We also see in Isaiah, which is the passage that I do have for you, 
This comes from Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 3 through 6. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and uh, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. So, in this passage of scripture, this is the prophecy of Isaiah. We also see here that, that what's happening is God has already, uh, that Isaiah has already seen what God is showing and that there is one who will come and suffer for our iniquities because we can't pay the price, just like Abram. If Abram had so much as stuck, stuck his toe um, into that blood path, he, he would be dead. He can't keep the promise. So God keeps the promise for us, and, uh, and that's what we see in this atonement. So, <clears throat> let's go on here. Uh, the doctrine of the atonement is scripturally, and it's biblically supported, but understanding how the death and the resurrection gives humanity the divine provision of being reconciled to God isn't easy to understand. Um, and it's not, it's not, there's no place in the Bible where it's just this concise paragraph that says, here's how the, the atonement saves you. Um, <clears throat> we're told in scriptures that it does. But how it does um, is something that, that humanity has been wrestling with throughout Christendom. And, uh, and that is what we call the atonement theories. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these up here for you. And we're going to go through each one of these. There are seven that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> they start with moral influence. And, uh, and so you'll see that you'll probably know some of these. You'll hear these, oh, yeah, I've heard that talked about, or I've talked about that myself, or, or um, you know, this makes sense to me, or that doesn't make much sense to me. But these are all the different um, theories of the atonement. Um, so... We're going to start with a moral influence, and, and this is the theory that's supported by Augustine in the 4th century, and it teaches that Jesus' life, um, his teachings and his actions, uh, and, the, and his death, were an example that would reform society by exemplifying a morality that could positively change humanity. So we would see his example, not only in his life, but also in his death, and we would exemplify that. So that's the moral influence theory. This is then there's the second one, which is the ransom theory. This one is not so accepted today, um, and it hasn't been accepted by by many <laughs> throughout history. But it but it is one of the theories. It's rooted in the early church and specifically in the third century, um, and the church father named Origen. Um, this theory deals mostly with the death of Jesus, which served as a ransom payment to Satan. Uh, which is what most believe, or even a ransom payment to God the Father. So Jesus' death satisfied the debt that was owed for the souls of sinful humanity, um, which had been sold to the devil by Adam and Eve at the fall. This, so this is, um, this is what Oregon understood the, the idea of the atonement to be about. This is that, that theory. So remember, it's, it's a theory. Therefore, Jesus' death paid the ransom required by the devil. Um, not knowing that Jesus could not be held by the devil, once Christ died, then it's like the devil said, yes, I've got the Son of God himself. Yeah, I'll give you all these souls back. I'll take, that. I'll take your son as the payment for the ransom. But then when Christ is resurrected, of course, because he's sinless, the devil can't keep him. So then he loses that too. He has nothing out of it now. Uh, not, not many accept this theory any longer, mostly because God doesn't owe anything to the devil. He, he doesn't pay ransom to Satan. Then there's Christus Victor. Now, this is the dominant atonement theory for most of historical Christendom. You'll probably be familiar with this one. And in this theory, Jesus' death was meant to defeat 
the powers of evil, sin, death, and the devil, to free humanity from bondage to sin. Now, unlike the ransom theory, um, Jesus' death didn't pay a debt to the devil or to God. However, it did defeat evil, and it served to free humanity. Then uh, the fourth one is the satisfaction um, theory. This is from, from Anselm. Uh, Anselm. Saint Anselm was the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, in the 12th century, and uh, the, the theory was proposed by Anselm. Anselm's theory suggests that Jesus' death satisfied or it made restitution for the justice of God. Because sin is an injustice to God, Jesus' death satisfied the justice of God by paying back the debt owed by humanity to God, which was in contrast uh, to the ransom theory that understood that the debt was, was owed to Satan by God. Then there is the penal substitution. This is number five. And uh, this theory was developed in the Reformation, which was um, a modification by John Calvin and Martin Luther uh, of Anselm's satisfaction theory. And in this theory, Jesus died to satisfy the wrath of God against human sin. The punishment of Jesus was the penal action taken upon Jesus. And it takes the place of sinners. This is the substitution. So... Uh, this satisfies God's justice, which requires God's legal demand to punish sin, right? It's, this is a, a legal demand. God's, God's righteousness, God's justice demands that sin is punished. So because Jesus has taken this punishment that's required by God's just, justice, then righteousness is imputed to humanity. So the difference between the penal substitution theory and the satisfaction theory is that in the penal substitution theory, Jesus doesn't doesn't satisfy God by paying a debt with his death. Instead, Jesus' death satisfies the need for punishment in place of sinful humanity. So this is the major theory, um, or the majority theory, uh, for reformers and evangelicals. N.T. Wright talks about this really interesting uh, talk that he has called Ask N.T. Wright Anything That's Being Done. This is a whole series, and he reminds us that that Jesus becomes sin on the cross. So remembering that the punishment is punishing sin. Um, so that's, that's how we can see this and understand it, that, that God isn't punishing necessarily his son. The son is becoming, is becoming the, the carrier, if you will, of sin. And he's putting sin on the cross through his, his body. And then, and then God is punishing sin, the sins of all humanity. Um, and so that, that sin um, is, is what is, is destroyed on the cross. Anyway, it's a deep, deep subject. And, and it takes a little more research and explanation. But N.T. Wright does a good job. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll look for that link to that discussion, and I'll, I'll add that um, to the bibliography. Sixth is the governmental theory. In this theory, the punishment for human sin is suffered by Jesus, which appeases the wrath of God. Again, this is another kind of like the one before. The difference in this theory compared to the penal substitution theory is that Jesus receives a punishment, um, but not the punishment that's deserved by, by sinful humanity. His death on the cross demonstrates God's hate of sin. So as we see the punishment, the, the, the passion of Christ, we see how much God hates sin, um, which also demonstrates God, God's wrath towards sin. So it shows that our sin really is offensive to God. It signifies the price that has to be paid because of sin. So this theory teaches that Jesus died only for the church and anybody who has faith takes part in this saving action of Jesus' death. Then finally, this, the scapegoat. This is the seventh. And in this modern theory from René Girard and James Allison, Jesus died as humanity's scapegoat. So this is a nonviolent atonement in which Jesus is the innocent victim of the violent crowd rather than the sacrifice. So that, that takes a little more research as well. Now there's some value in each of these theories. Um, though some are, are more theologically correct than others. So as for ransom, for example, 
although not many accept that theory, the ransom theory, what we see is that she's, there is some, some biblical roots to all of these theories. So as for this ransom, right, Jesus is said to be the ransom for many. We read that earlier from Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And, and Jesus certainly served um, in our place to take the punishment for our sins. <clears throat> so we see this in 1 Peter 2.24. Uh, this again is the NIV. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus was definitely a redemptive sacrifice uh, who gave himself for our sins to reconcile us to God. In Hebrews 9.12, we read that he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The scriptures of the New Testament also remind us that the sacrifice of Jesus was a victory over sin and evil, freeing humanity from the bondage of sin. We see this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, which reads, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision, uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The atonement, as John Wesley would explain, is the priestly work of Christ. It's, the, it's, the Christ, it's Christ standing before God in defense of humanity. So as Thomas Oden says, we have nothing to offer God but the merits of Christ. And that's why the atonement is so important for you and me. Now, I want to close with a, uh, a reading from the Salvation Army's um, Salvation Story, which is the Salvation, Salvation's Handbook of Doctrine. And, uh, and I'm going to read a passage here from, from what's, um, what's titled, Our Crucified and Risen Lord. And I'm just going to close after I read this, okay? because this is the Salvationist understanding of this. It is through the death of Jesus that our sins are forgiven and we're reconciled to God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from death is the ultimate confirmation of God's work of salvation through him. The resurrection is God's great life-affirming act, which transcends the boundary between life and death. God's creative power at work here reveals his glory and greatness. In his resurrection, Jesus Christ passed through death to a new life in which he reigns with God the Father in heaven. By the resurrection, his people are led to worship him as Lord and follow him into eternal life. For that reason, the resurrection provides the triumphant climax to the gospel proclamation of the earliest Christians. The obedient self-giving of Jesus has opened the way to his exaltation and to our salvation. I know this is a, this is a bit heavy, um, sometimes, some of this is for some of you. Um, I encourage you to do more reading on your own, more learning on your own. Watch videos and teachings of, from great teachers like William Lane Craig and uh, N.T. Wright. And uh, there are others, but read from Thomas Oden um, and others that, that write on Wesleyan Armenian theology. Now my cat's talking again. Uh, but this was, uh, this was helpful for me, and I learned a lot as I went through this. Uh, and studied a bit. So thank you again for being with me here on Enter the Word, and I look forward to being with you again very soon.